So, finally someone raises a question. Maybe the problem is your drugs are depressogenic agents over the long term. They cause a biological change that may be increasing your vulnerability to depression. And you'll see, this is raised by Giovanni Fava. He's the editor of Psychotherapy and Psychosomatics. He raises this in 1995. And when he raises it, one of the most famous psychopharmacologists in, in the United States, named Ross Baldessarini from McLean Hospital, he writes and he says this, I know this is uncomfortable to think about, but there's reason to worry about this. Okay, so he, he sort of legitimizes this as a, a, a valid inquiry. And then Giovanni Fava keeps, keeps um, hammering on this thing. He writes more, more articles about are these drugs and depressogenic agents. And then a very uh, a well-known mood disorders expert in the United States, and I think it was Donald Klein, and he writes to um, Giovanni Fava, and he makes this public. He says, stop raising this question. No one cares. The FDA doesn't care. The drug companies don't care. No one's going to fund research into it, so stop asking the question. He says this public. So what does Giovanni Faber write back? And he publishes it. Maybe you in the United States don't care, but we in Italy do, and we're going to keep raising this question. Now, for the... <laughs> Think about this, though. You don't care, you've got 20% of your population or 15% on antidepressants, so you don't care if you're making them depressed. I mean, it's a betrayal. It's a show. This is what we talk about in psychiatry under the influence. A medical profession should serve the public, not its corporate interests. And if you don't care about the long-term outcomes, you're not s serving the public, in our belief. Okay, so now I'm gonna look at, here's what we're gonna do in the next 15 minutes. <laughs> Now what I did in this book is I looked at all the studies I could find in modern times that compared the course of unmedicated depression versus medicated depression, okay? So this is in modern times. This was a study done in the Netherlands, a 10-year study, and they looked at first episodes of depression treated either with drug or without drug. Now I have to say, here in this data, it's actually not bad outcomes for the drug-treated patients. It's better than what you're seeing in the US studies. 50% only had one episode, 19% two episodes, 31% more than two episodes. But you see the, the unmedicated group? 76% never had another episode. So you can see here, even this, in this data, the unmedicated group is having fewer episodes, right? And if you look at the chronic group, it's 31 versus 13%. Okay? So, what do they conclude? A watchful waiting, because so often this is going to resolve. He's going back to these old days. If we just support people and give it some time, maybe it's going to resolve, okay? That's his finding. This is a large study in, in Canada. The way it worked was this. They had this survey data of almost 10,000 patients who were depressed, and then they just looked at people who were taking medication, who were not, and how many weeks they were depressed each year, and you'll see that the medicated group is depressed almost twice as much as the unmedicated group, okay? And this is people who initially had a diagnosis of major depression. What do they say? The researchers. I hope you see in this, this uh, collection of data that's starting to, you know, from all different ways that is telling a pretty consistent story. This person did not want to find this, but this is what he found. And he says, this is consistent with that hypothesis. Now, this was a study that was done by the World Health Organization. It was done to show the value of screening for depression, okay? That's the purpose, and here's, what, here's the way it was designed. Uh, World Health Organization investigators with, trained in the, the, the US dsm 4 at the time definition of depression went into clinics in 15 cities around the world, and like flies in the wall, they looked at people coming in for all sorts of care and identified those who were depressed by, their, by these standards, and they said nothing. And then they waited to see if the general practitioner diagnosed depression and how they treated it. And what they expected was some cases would go unidentified and they thought those people would have bad outcomes and the people who got identified would have better outcomes and the best would be identified and treated with depression, okay? So this is expected to show the value of a, um, a screening for depression and finding it. 
Now, this is on something called the general health questionnaire scores. You'll see something interesting here. In the first three months, there's all groups are getting better. And he ends up with four groups. Diagnosed with depression, treated with uh, sedatives, diagnosed, treated with antidepressants, diagnosed, no drug, and undiagnosed, no drug. Okay, that's the four groups. And what you see is there's improvement in all four groups, right, in the first three months. And you see the diagnosed antidepressants, that's the red group. All right, you see that red line? There's actually, it's doing pretty well compared to the diminishment of symptoms over that three months. But then look what happens between three months and one year. Those not on drug continue to get better. Whereas those on drug, they, if anything, they're, 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 they're just staying the same. Okay, so you're not seeing this longer get well path. Now, this is the percentage of people who were depressed in each four, four groups at the end of 12 months. And you'll see the group that is most likely, half of them who are still depressed at the end of 12 months is the diagnosed and treated with antidepressant group. They have the worst outcomes. So what do the researchers said? He said, they try to explain this, and they said, well, you see those not giving drugs? They were a little bit less depressed at the beginning. But they said, that doesn't explain it. Something else is going on. Even after we adjust for that little bit difference in, in baseline scores, you're still seeing greater improvement in the unmedicated patients. This is a study of disability. This, this was a study in Ontario. It looked all the people that went on short-term disability in that province in a couple years. I should have the N here. It's a large study. In Canada, if you miss work for 10 days, you go on short-term disability, and then either you get better and go on long-term, or you go back to work. So they looked at people who chose to take medication, those who did not, and they found that those who... Now, if, stop for just a second. If we just look at the medicated group that returned to work, 73% did. That's good, right? Three-quarters are going back to work. Only 20% went on to long-term disability. But still, it's the unmedicated group that is, much, is less likely to go on disability and more likely to return to work. So they said, this, this use of this medication for somehow sort of get people to think of themselves as depressed, adopt a sick role. What they're saying is this. They're saying it's not the drug biologically, but maybe think about this. You go into your, your physician. They say you have a broken brain. You can't do anything about it. You can't change your diet. You can't exercise. You can't like, go volunteer or anything. You have this thing. You've got to take drugs for life. You, you see the message you're giving to people? It's really a pessimistic message. It's you're sick, you're not ever going to be better. They are saying that maybe that's the problem. Frankly, I agree with that partly. That is a bad message to give people. You can't make changes in your life to get better. It is depressing. <laughs> It is depressing. Literally, I've interviewed about 100 people, and they say, like, you know, I, it took all hope away, basically. Basically, that's it. This is the largest modern study of this question. What is the course of unmedicated depression today? It came out of a large 25-year study of depression. They looked at, I think it had about an of about 500 people. They looked at those who were treated versus those who were not. You'll see the treated group. Three times more likely to um, cessation of role function. That means either they lose their job or if they're in a domestic role, they start, stop functioning in this way. The final is going on disability. You'll see a much higher rate of going on disability via the medicated group. Here's what, they, here's what the researchers concluded. The unmedicated group did not have a drop in socioeconomic status. And if you look at the unmedicated group, they did have a lot of upheaval in their lives. Divorce, that sort of thing. But they got through it is basically what happened. And they kept their jobs or moved to other jobs. OK, remember what they said about having discovered the modern course of depression? It's chronic. So this guy does a study. He's from Brown University. And he just follows unmedicated people now. People have been quite ill for 12 months. And what does he see? One month, most of them are still depressed. But how about six months? They're continually about 2% per week are getting better now. And by 12 months, 85% are better. Now, what was the course of unmedicated depression in the pre-antidepressant era? What did they say? 80 to 85% would be discharged within 12 months. They did a modern study, same thing. And what does he say now? You see how this puzzle is fitting together? 
We had a vision of unmedicated depression, which is actually a very um, optimistic vision. And then we adopt in the Medicaid area a very chronic idea about it. Now this person looks about it without this, and he finds most people are getting better. This is another study, and, and one of the things you've got to understand here, all these studies are done with a certain expectation that the drugs work. So these are all studies, findings, in essence, that are surprising to the researchers. This was designed like this, NIMH study. Had three arms, it's elderly patients or older patients. People are randomized either to drug alone, Zoloft, Zoloft plus exercise, or exercise alone. Now, if you read the general sort of new noise out there in newspapers and magazines, what do you hear? that drugs plus exercise are better than drugs alone. Okay, this was a study that was first done to really assess that. And what do you see? You see actually a lot of response in this way after, after four months in the Zoloft alone. 69% are in remission. That's extremely high. As I can tell you, is they must have, who knows why. Sometimes science tells a different story. Exercise alone, 60%. But now they follow them for six months. And look what happens at the end of 10 months. 52% of those on Zoloft alone are depressed. 55 on Zoloft plus exercise. Only 30% of exercise alone. So the drug is actually, a, a, it's like an anchor on the, on the stay well rate for the depressed patients. You see that? So drug plus exercise, 55% of that group is depressed at the end of 10 months if you don't have exposure to the drug, or you're on drug alone, or exercise alone, only 30% are, are um, on depressed at the end of 10 months. Okay, you see that? In this way, this drug is seen as a, an anchor. So, last little bit of this. You can see that this is starting to add up, right, the evidence? So now you actually do have some researchers beginning to hypothesize that why these drugs may be depressogenic over the long term. This is coming by Rifel Malik. He, he, he did a paper in 2011. Now, who's Rifel Malik? He used to work for Eli Lilly. So this is a guy who's very much in the mainstream when they were develop, you know, um, putting out Prozac. And now he's a psychiatrist at the University of uh, Illinois, I think it is. So what does he say? The problem is these drugs induce brain changes that are the opposite of what the medication originally produced. Rather than raise serotonergic levels, these drugs over the long term impair these pathways in the brain. That's that compensatory adaptation, okay? And then they do note this, at least in studies with rats, if you really deplete serotonin with an SSRI, because those presynaptic neurons now put out serotonin less than normal, uh, you'll get reduced serotonin now in the rats in nine areas of the brain. It shows you it's showing it into a deficient state. Leads to an increased, reduced density of receptors. And they do note that, so you give a rat SSRIs. It causes these changes and you'll see like some behaviors that, at least in the rat model, are associated with sort of a dysphoric mood. They, they mount other rats less, that sort of thing. They show less curiosity. So, just read this. We're almost done here. So you see how they're putting the whole picture together? You go on an SSRI, drives you into a subserotonergic state. Now when you try to come off, that can be difficult because your brain is adapted to the presence. But even if you stay on, you know, you may have this chronic illness. And look at the last statement. We'll try, um, I'll try to get to that in just the end. Such processes may not be reversible, meaning even if you come off, maybe your receptor densities won't renormalize, which means that going on the medications for a longer period of time is a pretty profound thing to do. And it means if you're doing it to your kids, maybe you should really be worried about this if you don't renormalize. We can talk about that in just a second. Anyway, quick few studies now. People are now investigating this in different ways. Do these drugs, do we have other evidence in humans that they increase the chronicity? This was a study where they looked at all the people who had remitted in studies either on placebo or on drug, okay? And now people are, so this is only those who got better in the, first, in, this, in the first study. And now what's gonna happen with those who remitted on the SSRI, they are gonna come off the drug, okay? And they found that among remitters, there's a relapse rate twice as high among the drug sort of responders, okay, or remitters. 
So what do they say? The fact that these antidepressants are perturbing these monoamino levels, then the brain compensates it. That increases the risk, risk of relapse when the drug is continued. Antidepressant use appears to increase biological susceptibility to depression. This is another two-year study. They looked at remitted patients. So some of these patients remitted on drug, some remitted off drug, and then they just looked at drug use in the next two years. You'll see that 60% of those who stayed with the antidepressants or used them uh, relapsed. 64% of those who used it some, but only 26 who did not use medications. They did not relapse in that two years. What do they say? May be involved in increasing vulnerability to relapse. So you see people are increasingly worried that the drugs cause a change that makes you more vulnerable to depression. Here's the summing up of the evidence. Look at this. Clinicians recognize this when the drugs come in. They worry, is it causing a chronification of the disease? We see now that in medicated depression, it runs a much more chronic course, that STAR-D study, that study in the 1980s. We see it's recognized. In studies with modern studies, medicated, unmedicated patients, you see better outcomes for the unmedicated groups over the long term, two, five years, et cetera. And now investigators have even proposed a biological explanation for why this is so, because the drugs cause the opposite effect of what is originally intended. Now, did you read about this paper in your newspaper? This is Rifel Malik. This is a mood disorders person who used to work for Eli Lilly. Or he might have just been a consultant. I don't know if he was on staff. Just read it. Don't you think the American public deserves to hear about this worry? By the way, I don't think tardive dysphoria is the same as depression, actually. <laughs> You know, if you've known people on the antidepressants for a long time, many of them will say they just can't get excited about things anymore. They seem sort of numb. They can't get emotionally engaged. That's tardive dysphoria. He uses it tardive meaning later onset. And dysphoria, I think, is actually quite different than depression. So depression, if you know, it hurts, right? You've been depressed? It hurts. It hurts like hell. It's painful. What they're really talking about here is an absence of feeling which in fact when we talk about the chronification of the disorder it's not I think actually what is happening is because of this serotonergic system which is such a common pathway in the brain and throughout the body it makes you less responsive to the world it's actually a little and it gets seen as chronic depression but as much as anything it's a chronic dysphoria which I think is different than depression so just real quickly and then maybe I'll talk about uh, we got about 10 minutes, about why they're worried that the drugs don't renormalize. Just remember this. Every drug has risk benefits, right? We've been talking about the benefit side of the equation, the, the capacity of these drugs to reduce depression. That's the benefit side. And now we're worried that it increases the chronicity. If you want to see the, then weigh the merits of the drugs, now you have to also look at all the, the, the negatives of that drug, the side effects. And you'll see there can be emotional bloodening. You'll see some cognitive impairment. There are some people think that it, it, it increases the risk of early Alzheimer's, dementia, obviously gastro, gastrointestinal effects, sexual functioning, suppresses REM sleep. You'll see some movement disorders. And it's pretty uh, well known now that if you're on an antidepressant while you're pregnant, it increases the risk of autism, uh, preterm deliveries, um, and there's some worry that because serotonin signals in the brain, helps the cells in the brain line up, it disrupts that normal sort of formation of, of, cortical, of cellular levels in the brain. And that's why they may hit, kids born to parents may hit developmental landmarks late. This is just seeing as we've been using antidepressants more, you'll see that the burden of depression has gone uh, dramatically up in our society and it's going up in, in, in society after society that has uh, embraced the use of antidepressants. So what this shows is at the very least is that the widespread use of antidepressants is not a very good solution to the depression that erupts in a society. Uh, this is an alternatives conference. I'm not going to go into it, but obviously there's all sorts of things you can do if you get depressed. Diet, exercise, become socially engaged. Uh, so much of depression clearly is almost a sign that something's going wrong in your life. So maybe you need to make some changes. Last thing here, so that's, and like I said, we'll look at antipsychotics and stimulants tomorrow. 
Why are we worried that the receptor densities may not renormalize? There's two reasons for this, or, or there's different ways, I should say, that, that this worry is arising. One is because of the sexual dysfunction. So you know in the 90s we began medicating youth, right? 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds with SSRIs. We never used to do that. Now about 60 to 70% of people on SSRIs will experience some type of sexual dysfunction. Uh, maybe a lack of desire is one, uh, difficulty orgasming, stuff like that. There's different levels of, of dysfunction, but in different studies it's 60 to 70%. So kids in the 1990s, as they're hitting puberty, are put on these medications, their sexual uh, interests are blunted, they go to college, starting in the early 2000s, and what do they want to do when they're at college? Have sex like everybody else, basically, right? And what they start doing is they, so now they go to their counselors, and some of this is research is coming out of the University of Iowa, and they say, I want to come off my antidepressants because it's blunting my sexual drive, and so they'll go off the antidepressants. And about 25% find that they can't get their normal sexual function back. And there's even a, a, a word for this, it's called or, a term, PSSD, post-SSRI sexual dysfunction. Now, I did, a, I did a magazine article. Well, I got commissioned to do a magazine article on PSSD. So when I got commissioned by the article, I said to the, I pitched it to a magazine. The magazine editor said, hey, do you want to write about anything? I said, I want to write about PSSD and kids, or youth. And I explained it to him, and he said, oh, that's a great story. And I said, but you'll never run it. I know you'll never run it. Look at your magazine. It's filled with pharma ads. You're not going to run this story. So I did the story, and they didn't run it. Um, Anyway, I talk to many, many people who are now in this boat, and they say it's not just sexual dysfunction. They'll say things like this. I see a rainbow, I can't get excited. I see a pretty girl, I can't get excited. I, I hear music, I can't get excited. So it's that the sexual dysfunction is more of a marker for sort of a general malaise. Now that's one bit of evidence. The second bit of evidence on this is coming from rat studies. So once this worry arises, they begin giving rats at a dose appropriate for a rat weight. When they hit puberty, and I think a rat hits puberty at around 45 days, and they keep them on that dose through puberty. And then they take them off, and they observe the rat behavior as adult rats. And what do they find is that they, they are not curious and they, 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 they show a lot of anxiety. They tend not to mix as much with the others. And the male rats, they, they don't mount. They, in the words of the researchers, they're impaired in their copulatory functions. <laughs> it's sort of the scientific term. But now they, now they sacrifice those rats that have been exposed to SSRIs, and they find that their receptor densities are abnormally low, even though they've been off the drugs once they left puberty. So this is one of the ways, it's through PSSD, even after people come off, that they get this persistent sexual dysfunction. It's not limited to kids, by the way. You'll see it in adults, too, somewhere around 20, 25%. And then there's one other reason to worry about this. It comes from tardive dyskinesia. Have you all heard about tardive dyskinesia? Is that a phrase? OK. So it arose in relationship to the first antipsychotics. So you put people on um, antipsychotics, Haldol, Thorazine, or, and um, People, after a while, start developing this persistent motor movement, uh, dysfunction. They might have a tongue that goes like this. It means they can't control their motor movement. You'll see a lot of jerky movements, that sort of thing. It's also a sign, by the way, of tardive dyskinesia is associated with um, cognitive decline. It's like a canary in the mind type thing for broader uh, a global dysfunction. Now, you take a person with tardive dyskinesia like a 35-year-old who's been on the drugs 10 years, you take them off, does the tardive dyskinesia go away? It doesn't. It persists. Now, on autopsy, what do you find? You find that people with severe TD, it's associated with an increase in dopamine receptors caused by the drug. The more severe is, in, is actually associated with more of this elevation in D2 receptors. But on autopsy, even if they've come off, the D2 receptors haven't renormalized. So this is part of the worry that these things persist. Now, I have to say, amongst many kids that get tardive dyskinesia, they're put on the antipsychotics, they come off it, they, re, they actually, TD disappears. So there's some sign, I think, that sometimes, we don't really know, these receptor densities do renormalize. It's sort of a question out there. Maybe it happens sometimes, not other times. I don't know. 
Maybe it's, it's a function of age. But do you see in this worry why this is such a big thing? We have 20% of our society on these drugs. This is happening, and we don't know what's happening long term. Yeah? Do they test the hormone levels like estrogen and those kinds of things? Do they see any great rise in estrogen? Well, the antipsychotics, I know, really change hormonal levels. Dramatically so. That's like the atypical antipsychotic, Cyprexa, um, Risperdal, etc. So they do test that, and that's a problem with the antipsychotics. I don't know with the SSRIs. Maybe there's a panel tonight, and maybe Dr. Cousins knows this, or maybe Irving Kirsch. I don't know the effect of SSRIs on hormonal levels. I know doctors, dealing, the few doctors dealing with PSSD, they're trying all sorts of things to try to, like, sort of push youth out of this, or you know, 25 year olds out of this sort of numbed out state, trying different strategies. I got 35 seconds here. So. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, I don't, okay, she's asking what about SSRIs in the water supply? They do show up in the water supply now. I don't really know this, and I, I wanna be really uh, cautious and not say anything I really haven't read myself and dug into. I think there is some sign it maybe affects the fish a little bit, the levels, but I don't know. I don't really know. Uh, so I'm going to have to punt on that one because I don't know. But you do get measurable levels of antidepressants in, in certain water streams. Yeah. So did you hear this answer? Do I know anything about supplements like 5-HTP as a, as a treatment for depression, you're asking? Yeah, so the way I looked at this is, you remember when I started, I said like I had completely conventional beliefs? So really I have spent my whole time putting that conventional story, looking what science has to say about that conventional story. And what I'm quite sure is that conventional story that we're told that fuels our belief in psychiatric medication and our use, and our use of them, the chemical imbalance story, long-term outcomes, science is telling a different story about that mainstream care than what psychiatry is telling us. In some ways, I have deliberately avoided thinking about uh, going down alternatives. One, because this takes a lot of time. But here's why, too. The minute you start saying that maybe a supplement is helpful, or whatever it might be, people say, ah, see, he has a, an ideological bias. He's, on, he's in favor of these supplements, the alternatives. No one can say that about me because I haven't investigated it. It really is this. All I've done is said, are you, the powers that be, telling us a true story about the na what you know about mental disorders, and are you being fully disclosing your worries about long-term course, the results from long-term courses, and what you see over and over again in those communications to the public is a story that is communicated that protects a market and a belief system, and unfortunately, even though science is undercutting it. But the answer to you is, in some ways, I protected myself from that criticism by saying, I have no horse to ride. I have no alternatives horse to ride at all. Do you see a similar, uh, you see a similar negative strategy of marketing in the suppression of the endocannabinoid system by mainstream media, science, uh, big business, pharma? I don't know that story. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a good story. I honestly don't know that particular story. I mean, I will be honest with you, I've spent a lot of time investigating this study story. It really ha first happened uh, when I was writing a book, Mad in America. That book was published in 2002. That upset some people. And my agent actually told me, said, because uh, by this time I had left daily journalism, I was trying to make a living as a book writer, and my agent said, Bob, stay away from psychiatry, it's a mess. You'll get attacked, you'll lose your credibility. So actually I wrote another couple books outside of psychiatry for that reason. It's just too uh, sort of perilous for a journalist to go down this path. But then people kept asking me, well, what about what's happening to the kids? What is happening to the animal? First book was just about severe mental illness. And so that's why I wrote Anatomy. And then I ended up getting recruited into this lab to study institutional corruption, which is where the last book came from. So there's, in some ways, it, it feels odd to be here. By that, I mean, it's, I know so little about these, this sort of alternative universe and these other questions. I just don't know of it. So, sort of a dunce in front of you. It seems like everything you presented here, there's a total absence of any kind of 
nutrition and investigation or you know, what's what's missing, what's abundant, what's over abundant. And even in the the fact that they, they said oh they recover with without the drugs with the drugs, they don't say anything about you know therapy. Right. So a couple of things here. One of these unmedicated versus medicated studies, the unmedicated group is just not taking drugs. <laughs> They're not getting any support, right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, that shows the, the, the sort of like, um, what is the word for his? The, 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 uh, the, um, well, they're not just the hubris, the, the, the incredible non-robustness of this research. So in other words, <laughs> well, that may be it. But the point is, it's, it's so it's an impoverished, this is the word for it. It's not even comparing like drug versus people who get a nutrition element or a real exercise element. It's, it's really drug versus leave them, they go off in their own way. So we don't even have the studies you're talking about, than, than about it, but how about a good diet? Now, I personally know, this. I, don't, I haven't studied this. I will tell you this from personal experience. If I don't eat well for about two weeks, I start feeling pretty crappy, right? We all know this, you don't sleep well, this sort of thing. What's that? And same thing with the lack of exercise. So this is isolating in a very isolated well, way the effects of drugs. And of course, we need now more attention, more research on diet, exercise, socialization. Like I think one of the problems with people who get, you know, quote, mentally ill, is they get isolated from people. They get fearful of people. And, and you know, no one does well isolated, or very few people do, do well isolate, you know, in an isolated state. So one of the things you could do in addition to nutrition and exercise is how do you get people integrated into social situations? I know a guy in Connecticut, he runs a program. It's called Volunteers for Psychotherapy. And his deal is this, you get, I'll give you one hour of free psychotherapy a week, an hour a week for free, provided you volunteer two hours per week. So now they have to go volunteer for homeless things or in dog shelters, that sort of thing. And here's what he says. I don't know if my psychotherapy is worth a damn, but I'm pretty sure the volunteer work is. <laughs> And I agree. And I agree with that. I mean, uh, yeah, it's uh, Rich Schulman. R Rich Sh Sh Schulman, I think, is what it is. In the back. Well, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, you mentioned that uh, nobody or very little has been done in looking at the uh, effect of dietary lifestyle changes on depression. We have a chip program that uh, con that consists of 35 hours of intensive education and is a community-based program, so there's socialization there. Short-term effects, 71% recovery of depression. Short-term. So it's, it's somewhat weak, but it's uh, maybe something to be pursued. Yeah, absolutely. And I should even give a caveat here is, there's, uh, there's certainly not pharmaceutical companies funding this sort of research into these, you know, nutrition and environment, you know, exercise, et cetera. The other problem we have is when the research is done on these things, it doesn't get promoted in the same way that drug research gets promoted for obvious reasons. So when I say there hasn't been done so much research, partially maybe I just don't know of it as well. But this is the sort of information I think we need to, to make known. The funny, and then I gotta let you go. I mean, this is like pre uh, preaching to a certain audience, of course. But in some ways, it's like common sense, right? Yeah. That like, if you eat well, you'll feel better, and if you exercise, you'll feel better, and that like, if you watch TV all day and just eat crap, you're not gonna feel good. My daughter, by the way, teaches in a high school in East New York. East New York is part of Brooklyn, okay? It's a very poor part of Brooklyn. She asks her kids, she's in a high school, what did you eat for breakfast? Now, what do you think those kids eat every day? Well, that would be a thing up. It's, it's donuts and Coke or something like that. I mean, the diet is just horrific. So, yeah. Depression is not a disease. You know, I mean, if I had a child pass away and, you know, it took me two years to kind of get normal, you know? But I went 
to a place where people that had a prior experience to it enlightened me on what they went through, and that helped me tremendously. And there was a total absence of any of that saying, hey, you know, it's normal, you know, if you get hit by a car, that you're going to be, you know, kind of jerky when a car pulls out in front of you. Right. You know, it's just normal things. Well, this is part of what's happened with ever since DSM-3. DSM-3 is that disease model. It absolutely is divorced from 2,000 years of, of medical history and literature and everything. Because, of course, we always used to know that depression and anxiety often arose in setbacks in life. Grief, you lose somebody, you lose a job. It was always understood that's not a biological problem. There was a real core thing called melancholy where that sometimes came out of nowhere. People couldn't get out of bed. That was seen as a biological problem. But it was always understood that this depression in response to life events was normal. And DSM-3 broke with that tradition and said, we don't really care about what's happening in your life. And we now have this absurdity that if you're still grieving, I think it's two weeks after you lose a spouse or a child, you can get a clinical depression as if it's a brain disorder. And anybody who's read Shakespeare would say, anybody who's not grieving uh, after two weeks, that's the person with uh, an abnormality. So anyway, thanks.